week's episode of Oh Sheep Ship. This week, I've got quite the, quite the character on joining us. This gentleman started his career actually as a Marine, then spent 12 years at PNG as a marketer, and then went on to be the CMO and then the Chief Experience Officer of the giant healthcare solutions firm, Centene. So many of people I know are still not quite familiar with this role the chief experience officer is all about. You know, at the most basic level, you could argue that they've got oversight for the entire customer journey and are accountable for improving it. But they also communicate the value proposition of the company, as in basically what will make one customer choose one company over another. But why do customers do this? Why do they, you know, choose how do they choose between kind of the, the classic tangibles of a product or a service's value? So today's guest, David Minifee, actually has a really great point of view on this because he doesn't think it's quite any of those things, which is why today's episode is called Why Leading with Purpose Matters. I encourage you to tune in if you've got questions, you've got thoughts, you want to share it, this is a live show, and please you know, share your point of view in the chat. And here we go with another week of O Ship. <music> David, welcome to the show. How are you? Hey, thanks for having me, Freddie. I appreciate it. And I just have to point out that while you've got a shark and an octopus or squid, there's no kraken in the in the opening. Like, you, I think you need to work on that a little bit. Uh, I, I could up my day. Maybe in, maybe in season three, we'll we'll introduce some new new sea monsters <laughs> into the intro. I, I almost, in this true spirit of O Ship, which I think is about acknowledging your mistakes, I love that I almost said the thing that almost sounds like O Ship <laughs> in my intro monologue today, uh, which I love just to keep things uh, really exciting. Um, so I've got a ton of questions for you. Uh, you know, we're, we're going to start with some some of the basic ones, uh, but for me, this is really the most important question. That awesome hair. Did you have that when you were a Marine or was this like hair that was waiting to come out like later in your life? Did you have like the full Marine buzz cut? Oh yeah. Like I, had, I had the full, full shaved head to start and then high and tight for, uh, for six and a half years. And then when that, when, when I resigned from the Marine Corps, my wife said, yeah, maybe, maybe go back to the hair you had in high school. I, I kind of yeah, like that. So I, I, uh, I'd go for that hair, but I think that is, <laughs> I, I, I was great. I was feeling like it was like it was waiting to come out, and you 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 heard <laughs> that. Um, so a, a couple of questions about your experience, um, you know, before we before we dive into kind of the meat of this week's episode. Um, you uh, were the you know, chief experience officer at, at one point in your career, but before that, you were the the CMO, and I'm just intrigued. Was was that? the the CMO role did that just involve into the the chief experience officer role or was it like a whole new role that was created at the at the company that's a that's a great question so when i joined centene uh in 2012 uh we were about five billion dollars in revenue uh we had over a dozen different brands and i was hired as the first chief marketing officer for the company in order to professionalize the way we were going to, to market. And for those people who aren't familiar with Centene, which is just about everybody, uh, Centene is a third party payer uh, in the healthcare space. And primarily at that time, it was dealing with Medicaid. So it was contracting with state governments to administer the Medicaid benefit to their citizens. Our CEO, Michael Nydorf, had started off his career early on as as a brand manager, and he knew that he wanted to professionalize the function. And he also understood that the Affordable Care Act, which had been passed in 2010, but not yet implemented, was going to change the way consumers interacted with the healthcare system. So we were thinking that, you know, consumerism or more consumer choice was was going to come to uh, healthcare. We're <laughs> We're nine years later, still waiting for that to happen. But, um, you know, I think that's that's the hope in the in the dream. And for us, um, I spent three or four years working kind of on marketing and then came to the realization that you can't market your way out of a crappy product experience. And let's face it, healthcare right now delivers 
a crappy product experience. If you're sick, you go to a waiting room with other sick people. If you're healthy and you want your annual physical, you're going to a waiting room with other sick people. And, uh, you know, th this is this is one of the last frontiers of of consumerism. So at Centene, we said, hey, uh, it, it, if we've got a, a lousy product, in, in part due to things beyond our control, maybe we ought to focus a little bit more on the experience. And, and you're right, Freddie, it, it really is about the entire consumer journey, uh, as well as understanding you know, your personas and motivations and, and how and why uh, consumers want to interact with, with uh, whatever product that the, the chief experience officer ha happens to be tasked with inside their company. Yeah, a, a lot of people kind of talk about the P&G experience uh, being kind of like the ultimate kind of brand marketer, uh, you know, brain trust or, or breeding ground, whatever you, whatever you want to call it. Um, when you think about uh, the, the roles you've had in your career, do you find that the, the concept of being a chief experience officer or the concept of being a CMO is, is more inspiring out of interest? I think the, the chief experience officer is more comprehensive than, than being a marketing officer. And I think it, when you think about the continuum of, uh, uh, of the consumer experience, it starts with transactions. Mm -hmm. A lot of advertisers care about transactions. Uh, and, and then it moves into engagements. And I think brand officers think about engagement, but we're, what you're really trying to get to, the holy grail of a product or a brand interaction is to create a relationship. And chief experience officers, I think, are more concerned about that top of that continuum or that pyramid than, than uh, folks who are focused exclusively or oriented exclusively on, on marketing or, or, or branding. Mm -hmm. So... Let's that go perfect answer. So let's use that as a good transition over. Um, yeah, core this week's episode. Wh why does perfect? Wh why does purpose matter? Yeah. So you mentioned Freddie that I started off uh, my professional career in the Marine Corps and uh, in the military and, and in the Marine Corps. We often will talk about mission. You know what? You you at this time are going to go over there and take that hill. But as part of every order that we give, uh, we also talk about commander's intent. It's the why you are going over to that hill. Because if your mission is to go to the hill to disrupt the communication of the enemy, and you get to the hill and the antenna has moved, your mission isn't done. Like Fair if enough. the intent is to disrupt communication, then you've got to figure out, okay, where do I need to go to next in order to accomplish that mission? Simon Sinek, you know, with his book, It Starts With Why, talks a lot about why purpose matters. <clears throat> what I like to think about is every company is mission-oriented. When I joined Centene, we were mission-oriented. We wanted to improve health outcomes and lower costs. Okay, do any of our competitors not want to do that? Does anybody want higher costs or worse health outcomes? The answer is no. Okay. But we didn't actually understand or have articulated why we existed. And so we did the work to, to uncover that. And we understood that we existed to transform the health of the community one person at a time. Okay, That's a lot more inspirational than saving money. Yeah. And I think the example I like to use uh, to kind of get this point across is with three companies that were founded in 1962 that all have the same mission. Their mission is to sell lots of stuff cheap. But in Arkansas, when Sam Walton decided to start Walmart, he had in his mind the purpose of improving the standard of living for everyone. And as we know, you know, Walmart is the world's largest retailer. Um, but, it, you know, they had some bumps along the way. Uh, in the late 1990s, Walmart had 99 consecutive quarters of growth come to an end. So that's one quarter shy of 25 years of, of growth. 
And if you remember back in the early 90s, their, their tagline was brand names for less. Brand names gets you value, for less gets you cost savings. That answers the purpose that Sam Walton had sent out, which is to improve the standard of living. If you can get the same thing that rich people get for less money, then your standard of living goes up. Um, at the time that their, their growth came to an end, they had just changed their, their tagline to everyday low price. And that came with a strategy shift that also moved them away from name brands like Tide and Charmin and to own label, private label, their own brands. And their shoppers weren't fooled. The shoppers didn't want cheap toilet paper for less. They wanted great toilet paper for less. And so they, they modified their strategy, kind of went back to their roots. And as, as we all know, they're the largest retailer in the world. Target, which was founded in, in Minneapolis out of uh, department store roots, really has as their purpose to bring design to the masses. And if you think, think about the feeding frenzies that their fall kind of design collaboration prompts, um, I, I remember, uh, you know, maybe 10 years ago, they had collaborated with Lily Pulitzer, my wife and daughter, who you know, was, was in grade school at the time, planned to be there at the opening. There was a line out the door and, you know, they managed to get away with two towels and some plastic dishes and thought that was a victory. It was like, it was a, it was like a Black Friday, you know, frenzy. Black Friday people like the sea of people. Exactly. <laughs> I got it. Yeah. <laughs> and, and for a long period of time, Target uh, was the most profitable retailer by square foot. Now, is the shopping experience at Target and Walmart very different? Yes. Because Walmart is almost like at the verge of chaos, right? They've done studies to understand how chaotic the store can be before people stop shopping there. Why? because labor costs money. They pass those savings onto their shoppers. Target has a different point of view. If they're gonna bring design to the masses, then it has to be a well-designed shopping experience. So bright lights and white floors and super clean. We haven't talked yet about the third retailer that was, was founded in 1962, which actually got the biggest, the fastest. And if you remember the blue light special in Kmart in the, in the 80s, you'll understand that they were activating their mission. We're gonna sell, our mission is to sell lots of stuff cheap, put the blue light on, let it go off, we'll st sell even more stuff, even more inexpensively. Um, and they gobbled up a, you know, a, a bunch of competitors who, who couldn't compete with them. But what's their purpose? I, I think now it's a murder-suicide pack with, with Sears. Right. And in part, it's because their CEO, uh, Eddie Lampert, is a finance oriented individual. Right. He's trying to figure out how to cost save his way to growth. And at the end of the day, understanding your why you exist gives you the opportunity to create sustainable long term competitive advantage that just operating on your mission doesn't get you to. So, so I have to ask in this, in, uh, just you know, given the companies we're talking about, I think I just read recently, and I, I could be wrong with this, but I could have sworn I just read recently that uh, Amazon is now considered kind of the, the you know, just surpassed Walgreens in, in, uh, in a couple of different fronts. I, I'm not sure if I know what Amazon's brand stands for on, on any, in any way, shape or form. Um, do you think Amazon has a purpose? I, I think... do. Do you think anyone knows what it is? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I think I, ha I haven't spent a lot of time, Freddie, thinking about Amazon. But, you know, if you look at their logo, you know, it's a smile and an arrow from A to Z. Right. And, and, and I think from a founding standpoint, there was a great desire to make life easier in all ways for all things. Now, obviously, they started out in, in, in the book space and expanded more into retail. But, you know, most of their money is being uh, made with their web services uh, and, and their cloud services. So I, I believe uh, that Steve Jobs and, and Bill Gates 
uh, and other Silicon Valley individuals understand purpose. I'm not sure Zuckerberg does. Um, you know, at Facebook, when you look at their missteps, you know, I think that that tends to be a more profit-driven organization. Uh, but I, but I think to your point, Freddie, I think I think Amazon does have a purpose. Um, and you know, next time you have me on, I'll I'll think about it and, and come back and try to articulate it for you. <laughs> yeah, no, no, uh, no, no worries. So um, th- I think that was a really great. Uh, illustrated example when you start thinking about um, the retail space uh, and, and actually just three big businesses that have a value prop that, that a lot of us understand and, and engage with. Um, any other examples of, of companies you've seen, um, organizations or whatever that um, you think are getting this right or, or not getting this right? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the airline industry has tended to be much more mission focused. Um, and if you look at their business results over time for, for Delta and United and Southwest, you'll see that they go through periods of profitability and then periods of, oh, the government has to bail them out because they're on the verge of failure. Uh, Southwest Airlines, however, has done a much better job. And um, like Walmart, I, I think is very purpose driven. I think they don't they they know their mission is to fly airplanes, but their purpose is to democratize travel. And when you think about the experience, because we started talking about the the chief experience officer role, the experience of flying on Southwest is very different than flying on United Airlines. On United Airlines, I think there are five or six fare classes from uh, first and business class up front that get free food to no frills in the back. Think about the burden that puts on their flight attendants to to have to treat people who are all on the same plane going to the same destination differently. Whereas Southwest Airlines, when you fly there, you don't you don't even have a seat assignment. Mm-hmm. You, you line up A1 to 30, A31 to 60, and do it again for B and C. And you know as a passenger that we're all in this together. Um, I, I think, you know, having flown on, uh, you know, multiple airlines in general, I feel like people are more polite as passengers on Southwest airlines than they are in other airlines. And, you know, I think we all saw the headlines no, no, a, no, a couple of years ago. I'm sorry, Freddie. No, it doesn't have quite the no sense of entitlement. Or right. Or, it, it, exactly. And it, so it's that, that idea of democratization which causes them to make operational decisions about not charging for baggage or, or change fees flows through into the, into the passenger experience. <coughs> Excuse me. I think we all heard the, the headlines a couple of years ago on United Airlines where you know, a passenger was, was physically accosted and removed from the, from the airline. I, I can't imagine that happening on, on Southwest. You know, it's funny, the, the airline industry has probably been affected uh, more than most uh, for obvious reasons during the pandemic. Um, how, how do you feel like uh, things like purpose help people with maybe their resiliency in in these really tough times? Maybe maybe tough times doesn't always have to equal giant, insane global pandemic, but just, you know, right. when, when they're, you know, do you, do you think when, when is this purpose matter more when like things are great and it's and everyone's doing wonderful as the old competitive businesses or does it matter most when when people are back to the corners and maybe there's less opportunity for companies competing for a certain amount of market share or or does it make no difference at all do you, you know what i mean i, I do i i think purpose always matters um jim stangle the former uh, chief marketing officer for, for Procter & Gamble put a book out maybe 15 years ago called Grow, where he, he examines purpose-driven versus non-purpose-driven companies and, and determined that over the course of time, purpose does create sustainable um, advantage. I think from an employee base, and, and you know, I've, been, I've worked in companies that have acquired others as well as acquired divisions, from a culture standpoint, purpose is, you know, the spine of the organization. It, it helps to keep everybody upright and straight and in working as a body. 
um, I think in tough times, purpose matters more, right? In good times, you can be mission focused and just focus on the margin and celebrate the fact that you're delivering, you know, the best business results ever. But when business gets tough, when economic times get tough, focusing on the margin is not celebratory. (laughs) It's about risk management. And that can be a very doom and gloom kind of atmosphere to work in. But if you're purpose driven, you understand why you exist as an organization and you can rely on that. I think it not only helps internally with culture, but it also helps, you know, externally as you're, as you're dealing with clients and, and customers. Yeah. yeah huge. Uh, again, is uh, I think we're, we're, I want to go back to this kind of um, external versus internal uh, point of view on, on purpose in a minute, because I think there's a whole world of kind of really interesting conversations to have there. Um, let, let's do just one more example, I think, to really help illustrate uh, this point. Um, any, any other, uh, maybe a different type of industry, uh, you know, that kind of helps um, illustrate this, the kind of the, the power and value of purpose? Yeah. So I was talking to a friend of mine <clears throat> from Procter & Gamble who had gone on, this is probably four or five years ago, to, to work for uh, the Cleveland Indians. And he was in a leadership, and he was... Yeah. And he was in a leadership position there. And, you know, we were talking about some of the the challenges and and obviously Cleveland is a land locked market. It's surrounded by Detroit and Toronto and two clubs in Chicago and in Pittsburgh and in Cincinnati. So it's a very small geographic region that it can, can draw on. Um, It's a small market, right? So they've, they've got, they've got challenges, you know, from a revenue standpoint. And I was, we, we were talking about, you know, some of the challenges and how, how they were dealing with things. And I said, hey, Brian, um, you know, what's, what's, what's the club's purpose? And he said, um, to deliver a great fan experience and to win the World Series. And I said, okay, so you've been unsuccessful for like 80 plus years. And he kind of laughed at me. I'm like, what, what you described to me, Brian, is the mission. Right. You want to feel the championship team and deliver an unforgettable fan experience. And and that is the, the stated mission for any sports entertainment organization. But like understanding why you exist is 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 important. And so we did some work together and and they finally uh, came to articulate their purpose as to unite and inspire their city through the power of team. Well, man, how powerful is that? Like, I want to, I want to work for a unite and inspire organization. And, you know, from an internal culture standpoint, they worked, they worked that together both with baseball operations as well as business operations. So they work to unify the, the, the whole kind of internal organization uh, and that was the foundation uh, for their rebranding, renaming work, which they started last year and, and uh, delivered this summer. And, you know, at the end of the day, they felt they couldn't live their purpose to unite and inspire the city with a name that was divisive. And so there were a lot of, you know, I think reasons and, and timing associated with the name change, but when you understand why you exist, you you use that for for big decisions, whether it's rebranding like the the Cleveland Guardians will be next year, or whether it's charging bag fees or change fees like like Southwest, or whether it's choosing to allow your your store to to look a little shoddy like Walmart does, but reinvest those cost savings back uh, in, to the customer. So. Um, you know, I think, you know, the pro and con is we've, we've given some examples here would be for the Washington NFL club, which seems to be lost in, in trying to figure out what their new brand should be. And, and, you know, I might encourage Dan Snyder to actually figure out why he owns that team, why that team exists in the first place, do that work first and allow that to drive to whatever the, the name or branding change needs to be. 
Yeah, I, I really love the the insight um, around it about being uniting uniting a city. So I, I support Crystal Palace. Uh, I'm not a baseball fan. I'm really an American football fan. I'm only a her first, uh, you know, football or soccer fan, however you want to call it. Um, but I support Crystal Palace, and they are not exactly known for being the most winning team of all time. I frequently joked that when I was a kid, the thing they were probably most famous for was having the best riots in England. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, other than that, they weren't exactly, you know, a, a big top tier team, and, and they've kind of, you know, danced in and out of the Premier League for a long time. But it's not why you go to see the games, you know, it's about getting together with other fans and, and, you know, finding that community and, and, and uniting folk. And, you know, whether people like the new name uh, that Cleveland picked or not, you know what, I, I can I can understand why some people may be unhappy or happy about whether that was the right name. Um, and I understand people's, you know, who have uh, nostalgia for something that's existed maybe part of their childhood for a, a long time. But at the end of the day, I'm a big believer that you have to have a strategy and the way that you execute upon that strategy has to be aligned. And if you're really about uniting your community, then you can't have a divisive name. And I think, right. and I think I, I would challenge people to say, they could say they disagree with the strategy at that point. That's again, everyone's personal opinion. But if you believe that is the, the purpose and that's the strategy and that's the purpose, then it's hard to not acknowledge that maybe the name needs to change. Right. You know what I'm saying? I do. Um, and so, um, so I, I, I love that. I love that uh, kind of backstory you gave it. So um, this, this is super interesting. I, 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 you know, you clearly have a very strong opinion about, uh, you know, all of these different industries and, and why purpose uh, matters and why you need to lead with purpose. Uh, just just for fun, I got to ask any like just like pet peeve companies out there there or industries that just yeah. kind of rub you the wrong way on doing this wrong. Yeah, I, I've I've got a I've got a pet peeve with with a a product area that has cropped up over the last couple of years uh, on, on spiked seltzer. Uh, yeah. And listen, I use the pandemic to to teach my my daughter who is you know twenty years old at, at the time how to make cocktails because I think it's a life skill to to, to know know how to make a Manhattan in an old fashioned and you know a Tom Collins and and, okay. and her Tom Collins is is fantastic. Uh, Tom Collins. Congratulations yeah. sir you you've 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 succeeded at a fatherhood. Yeah and so 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 this this the seltzer thing I'm like it's not that hard. Like you you, you get some tonic or some seltzer water and you pour some booze into it and you garnish it like do i really have to pre-package a mixed drink like that so i mean i and i know truly and white claw and now bud light seltzer are, are coming out and i'm sure doing their thing and fantastic but but i think unfair i mean have you identified what their purpose is their purpose may be to bring terrible drinks to everybody and I, if that's their purpose then they've achieved that because it's in line with the strategy so i mean i think yeah. it's very judgmental of you to not like them without it's it's, com it's completely judge completely judgmental and their purpose is the same as zima and bartles <laughs> and james wine coolers back in the 80s which is to get young people who can't tolerate alcohol drunk really really fast oh my god but but I think this, but Freddie, I think this brings up you know a great point. I think you know um, White Claw and Truly from a brand situation have done a great job at, at launching those brands and and pushing those products. Um, you know Anheuser Busch, you know after the the 3G kind of takeover, I think has really really struggled uh, to grow their core businesses. I. I've talked to a couple of people who have said that over the last several years, more than a hundred percent of uh, Anheuser Busch InBev's growth is coming from new brands or, or acquired brands, which means that their flagship brands are not delivering. <clears throat> and <clears throat> and I understand Bud Light Lime. I don't understand Bud Light Seltzer because now you're 
now you're uh, like when you think about <clears throat> Anheuser Busch and, and their brand portfolio, they're kind of like P and G, you know, a, a house of brands, and you know they kind of kind of co-wrote the book with Procter and Gamble and and craft on, on how to get out there and, and launch a new product line with a new brand positioning. And I, I don't understand why they would choose to dilute the Bud Light uh, brand and image with a, a seltzer offering. It, it seems like lazy brand management work to me. Yeah. It's uh, you know, they talk about that concept of kind of, you know, brand stretch and, and yeah. where can your brand kind of authentically go? Uh, and and it feels you know like something that consumers will accept, and uh, sometimes not only will they not con- you know accept it, but they'll it actually diminish the overall brand, and that's yeah. that's, a, that's a big problem, especially when you've got these kind of hugely iconic brands. So um, I'd l- love to jump uh, over just change gears. Earlier you mentioned uh, kind of the internal uh, version of you know, what it means to lead with purpose. We've talked a lot about the external, had some very fun examples on a side note, so thank you. Um, but I'd love to understand what you've learned about applying leading with purpose internally, whether that's through leadership or just, you know, it could be the mantra of the business, but I'd love to just get your take in, in that area. Yeah. I mean, so, so for me, you know, uh, while I was at Centene, I started every department meeting with, you know, our, our corporate purpose slide. We just regrounding. There were five beliefs on there, uh, three uh, brand values and, and the purpose and the mission at the top and just saying, hey, we, we are a purpose driven organization. We need to always remain focused on the fact that externally this is about improving the health for a population that is that is underserved and under respected. And, and we need to focus on that. And and drive that um, <clears throat> from a leadership position. Um, <clears throat> it, it just gives you consistency and strength when you're talking about you know tough decisions, and we're talking about you know embarking on projects that will you know potentially take several years to complete. You know, being able to draw back to how that is bringing either your purpose or your mission, or or hopefully both, to life. I think just adds credibility to. Uh, to you as a leader, you know, you're asking people to do things on behalf of the organization, not on behalf of you personally. Um, <clears throat> and from a, a culture standpoint, it, it's a unifier. You know, um, it, it really helps you when you're working with other departments who, you know, have different priorities or, or goals than your department has. Uh, when you're working with, you know, maybe a, a, you know, a division that's been acquired you can say, hey, listen, we we purchase you because there are good things about you, but we brought you in to help us to deliver on our purpose. So, you know, you know, there's been tons of studies about why mergers and acquisitions fail. And almost all of it, I think 80% of the failures due to cultural misalignment. And so having an articulated purpose and using that to align the cultures across departments, divisions, uh, you know, organizations, I, I think is is super powerful and, and, and helpful um, as you're trying to build long-term sustainable advantage. Um, what about uh, when you, let's say you change your purpose or you evolve your purpose or, you know, if maybe you didn't have one before and then you kind of you know, align them one as an organization and then, you know, as a leader, one of the things that you need to do is is aligning your your team and your organization mm-hmm. behind that purpose. What if, for some reason, and I don't know what that purpose is, you know, not everyone believes in that in that new purpose within the organization, and you know, some people uh, will go, "Hey, this isn't for me anymore. I'm gonna I'm gonna move on. I'm gonna find my next my next job." Mm-hmm. But other people are very frequently too afraid to actually leave their jobs. They're complacent or whatever it is you know, it may be, uh, even when they don't have alignment with the broader org anymore, or they wait four years to do it because they just, they just you know, can't you know, the fear, whatever it is, right? As a leader, how do you think you need to handle those kind of people? And how, you know, how do you deal with that? Because it, I mean, I'd love to think about what the repercussions are and and what the approach would be for, for a challenging situation like that. Yeah, that's a great question, Freddie. And what I would say, you know, I, and I used to, to 
do the new employee orientation uh, for employees at Centene and, and talk about the purpose. And I would kind of read through the belief statements and the purpose statements. And I would always watch the audience to make sure I was getting head nods. And I would literally say at the end, if you, if you don't buy into this, you know, let us know because we will help you to move on, right? The purpose, you know, for an organization, it might not be articulated, but if it is, it shouldn't change, mm -hmm. right? Sam Walton's vision is still alive and well, uh, you know, over half a century later. Um, and, and I think that, you know, when you have the right purpose, it, it endures. Your, your vision should change, you know, every you know, five to 10 years and your strategies might change, you know, on an annual basis. Uh, but that purpose uh, should be there for, for a long, a long time. But if you get to the point where you're just articulating it and then, you know, kind of working to disseminate that and get buy-in, you know, as, as you feel or hear dissent, you know, then you, um, you know, as a leader, I think it's your responsibility to help both that purpose, that person and your organization to find the right next fit. You know, I'll give you an example of, uh, you know, when I dealt with this, I had a, I was an assistant uh, associate marketing director at Procter & Gamble. I had a very talented brand manager uh, working for me. She was fantastic. Um, I gave her her annual review, which was good. You know, the sky was the limit for her, you know, inside P&G's. Um, as far as I could tell. And she said, thanks. And, you know, we had another couple, uh, you know, uh, of comments. And, and I said, Don, um, I just, before I let you go, I just, I just have to ask you, why are you working here? And she said, what? And I said, look, you're awesome. Like you, you, you can do whatever you want here, but I get the sense that maybe you feel like you should be doing something else. And she said, no one has ever asked me that before. And I kind of think you're right. And she left the six, she left the company about six months later and she went and did volunteer work in Africa for a year or two. And then she came back to the U S and started her own business. I'm like, yeah, it was like, it was probably not in P and G's interest for me to <laughs> ask that question of her, but it was certainly in her interest to, to have that question asked so she could answer it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's, there's sometimes you say that, uh, say things like, Hey, it's not, not maybe not in the company's best interest. <clears throat> and, um, but I, I do think one thing that people need to watch out for, whether you're an entrepreneur or you're a leader in any way, shape or form, um, you know, having bodies, you know, that can do the work while convenient when you're trying to you know, run a business or execute something um, and very inconvenient to lose some of these people, particularly, particularly if they're, you know, anything better than a, you know, be, be, your, be your higher player. Um, it, at the end of the day, it always hurts you. And I think, you know, so, so to encourage her to figure that out about herself, hopefully created space for you to find someone who really was aligned with that. And, um, you know, in, at least in my experience, when I look at any of the organizations I've either participated in as an employee or as an independent leader, even in the, and, and certainly the ones in the one, uh, companies where I've been the owner or co-founder or one of the leaders, um, the number one thing that, that made the difference was uh, cultural alignment. And you could very much argue that, that the purpose is the guiding light of that culture. Um, you know, so cultural alignment obviously is great when everyone gets along and cares about the same things in life, but, um, but then they obviously need to care about the same things the company do, does. And so I think, um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's sound advice. And I think I would encourage more leaders, I guess is my point, uh, that if they sense those kind of things in their own people, have the courage to ask, have the, you know, it, it, it's, it, it may be scary. And you may feel like you're opening yourself up for risk, but you're you're doing the right thing. And if they're on the fence, you will have an opportunity to hopefully you know, bring them on board onto the shared vision. So there's really no loss, or maybe some short-term pain, <laughs> but there's no there's no loss by by kind of doing it um, the right way. Yeah, I think I think that's a great observ observation there, Freddie.
who's the who's the most inspiring leader you've ever worked for out of interest? Uh, <clears throat> that, that's a that's a great question. I, <laughs> yeah, no, I there were there was a uh, Marine Corps uh, major, and then uh, he was promoted lieutenant colonel named Jerry Walsh, who was probably uh, one of one of the best leaders and certainly the best men I've ever been associated with. But another one was. Um, uh, Staff Sergeant Roberto Gonzalez, who uh, Marine, for the record. both both Marines, uh, I'll come back and, and talk about uh, uh, non-Marines, but uh, Staff Sergeant Gonzalez was my platoon sergeant. He technically worked for me. Uh, he taught me a ton about about leadership and and how to get things done. And and uh, <clears throat> I remember I gave him my first <clears throat> fitness report, uh, you know, evaluation. And he said, thank you, sir. Now that you've counseled me, let me counsel you, which was just a great example. And yeah. so, you know, that always, that example allowed me to have the, uh, you know, the moral courage to give feedback to my superiors, both, you know, in the military and, and in civilian life. And sometimes, you know, in corporate America, you give the feedback and it falls on deaf ears. And then you're like, okay, this is not the boss I need to, to work for anymore. Um, two great leaders uh, that I worked for at, at Procter and Gamble. Uh, the first I already mentioned, Brian Barron, who is now with the the Cleveland uh, soon to be Guardians, uh, and uh, David Taylor, who is now the CEO of, of Procter and Gamble. I got I got to work for him when he was uh, uh, division uh, general manager, and they uh, all four of those people um, wanted good news fast, bad news faster. They wanted open dialogue and open communication. Um, and they all, uh, they all gave leeway, right? So they didn't, they didn't micromanage me. They didn't put me in a box. They, they allowed me to make decisions and defend them, you know, even sometimes when there was, there was risk involved. Um, and they all operated with, with great integrity. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that's something that, that, you know, uh, I try to model as well. I'm going to, I'm going to ask you two more final questions on, on this week's so ship. So, and they're going to be intertwined. So the first one is what is the best thing or the most useful thing you learned while being a Marine that you've applied to your, to your corporate life? Yeah. Uh, just open, honest communication. Like when, <clears throat> when, when you're, when you're in the military, you know, the first thing you learn as a, as a, as a plebe at the U S Naval Academy is that there are only five possible responses that you can give. Uh, yes, sir. No, sir. I, I, sir. Uh, the proper answer or I'll find out. Right. And so don't, don't lie. Right. Lying leads to, to risk and uh, in a military situation, you know, loss of limb or, or life. Uh, and so those are great skills to have as a spouse, as a parent, uh, as an employee, as a leader. Um, and, and I also learned, you know, when you make a mistake, you fess up immediately. Like, don't let it fester. Say, hey, I did this. You know, I crashed the car or I did it wrong. You don't. You don't try to hide the scratch on the car <laughs> yeah. and, and hope your parents find it at some point in the future. You say, hey, man, this, this happened and now we have to deal with the consequences. Love it. So let, let's put this on its head now for a second. So if you could go back in time and take anything that you've learned from corporate life and you could go right back and you were back in the back in the Marines. Sorry, you got to shave your head again. Um, <laughs> what would what would be the big the big thing you learned uh, there? And Oh wow! Um, <clears throat> I think <clears throat> I think team building is really hard. Um, you know, I think it's it's in some ways it's easier in the military because you're used to switching units and having people come in and out, and there's a common ethos already built in because you, you've you've taken an oath and you've you've gone through boot camp or officer candidate school, and so there's there's a common you know, indoctrination or inculcation of, of culture, <clears throat> but just because 
you're wearing the uniform doesn't mean that you've lost your individuality. And so focusing on each person in your organization as an individual um, <clears throat> really helps to, to drive teamwork and, and drive uh, respect and esprit de corps. That's great. I, I love it. Uh, that's really a positive and high, high note to end the, this week's yeah. episode on. Uh, Dave, I just want to thank you again for, for coming on the show. It's been really great to pick your brain. You, share, you shared some good laughs. You had me cracking <laughs> up there, and you had some really great points, yeah. points of view that I know our audience uh, would have really enjoyed. Um, so for those of you who are watching, whether you're watching us live or uh, watching us uh, you know, on one of our other channels now, um, thank you for subscribing. Thank you for watching. Thanks for tuning in every single week. If you haven't subscribed or, or uh, supported us or watched one of our episodes before, the best thing you can do to kind of uh, support OSHIP moving forward is you know, click on that subscribe button, click on that uh, like button, share it on your social feed. Uh, OSHIP is something we just do because we're passionate about it. We love bringing in these great guests for you every single week and talking about big, inspiring uh, topics. And um, the other thing you can do, we kept made it really easy for you moving forward. You can go to oshipshow.com where you can see direct links to all of our different feeds from our newly released audio podcast to all of the different places that we broadcast uh, with um, OSHIP uh, every single week. If you want to catch up more uh, with Dave, you can find him on Twitter at uh, Minify, uh, Minify's Take. So at Minify, uh, Minify's Take uh, on Twitter. And Dave, any last and uh, any final words for the audience before we sign off for this week? No, just just thanks for that time, Freddie. I appreciate being here, and uh, <clears throat> you asked me some some good questions. Right, perfect. Sorry for butchering your Twitter handle there for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank everyone. Thank you so much uh, much for tuning into OSHIP. We look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you again. <laughs>